Thank you, Slavo. And of course, I would like to express you my gratitude. You see how she appropriates authority. Who is she to thank me as <laughs> she is a boss? Okay. In the Deutsches House for this generous invitation. So my, the title of my paper, as Slavo mentioned, is Where Does the Dirt Come From? And I want to take this up from the perspective, of course, of psychoanalysis, and particularly in relationship to entities like jokes and comedies. So roughly this will be the space of my talk. So you probably all know this uh, famous formula which was originally used by William James and later made uh, famous by the anthropologist Mary Douglas, which says dirt is matter out of place. And uh, as uh, Anne Carson paraphrased it, the poached act on your plate at breakfast is not the dirt, the poached act on the floor of the reading room of the British Museum is. And this became a kind of important topos in postmodern theory in general, but especially in the postmodern theory of power, uh, with the main thesis very roughly put, being that power is the power of giving, giving place, taking place, putting one in one's place, and so on. Of course, without denying pertinence to this kind of uh, thesis or arguments, I would nevertheless argue with Freud, who also quotes William James as saying at some point, that it is nevertheless too short. I think Freud was quite right in insisting that in order for matter or something else to become dirt in this strong meaning of the word, something more is needed. Something precisely, uh, one could say of the order of the, of the idealism, something which Freud calls repression precisely. Something of the order of repression has to take place. And of course this is in tune with the more general psychoanalytic or Lacanian stance, according to which society and civilization are not simply formations uh, exercising suppression, I don't know, uh, um, prohibitions, restrictions, and so on, and hence inducing repression in the clinical sense, Verdrängung. There are also, and above all, edifices built from repression, from Verdrängung. And this is the Lacan's famous saying, Suppression comes from repression, from for drinking, and net, not so much vice versa. And this, I think, is also a very important point in the context of discussing comedy. One could be easily tempted to use the James's formula in context of comedy and say, for example, that dirt as comic object is matter out of place. Why not? Of course, it seems to work in a lot of cases and to nicely encapsulate some aspect of comedy. As do many other formulas that have been proposed over the centuries in the discussion of comedy, like, I don't know, to show something that should have remained hidden, or the famous Bergsonian mechanical encrusted upon living. And I think Freud's groundbreaking contribution to this field does not consist in proposing yet another truer formula, but in showing how all these formulas perhaps remain insufficient if we don't take into consideration yet another level that structurally motivates them or kind of twists them uh, and that motivates what these formulas describe. Um, and this is what he calls precisely repression. And when I say what structurally motivates this, I want to emphasize that what is at stake here is not any kind of subjective, let's say psychological motivation since psychology itself is also secondary to repression in this strong meaning of the word, it is its result. And repression in the strong sense of the word pertains to structure, to language as such, which is precisely why something like joking can be so universal, come to that. But, and just by the way, I think to, to, to emphasize this kind of primal, or one could even say transcendent, a character of repression, in relation to its everyday empirical forms, Freud introduced the concept of primal repression, this Urverdringung, claiming that uh, this ordinary repression, repression proper, he says, is therefore actually an after pressure, nachdringen. Okay, but uh, now th this dirt that I want to talk about today is thus a particular kind of dirt, a spiritual dirt as it were, uh, namely enjoyment. Enjoyment is a rather peculiar substance. And my question will be, 
where does the enjoyment in comic effects comes, come from? To refer to enjoyment as dirt is not meant in a moralistic way, but in the sense of something that has the habit of sticking on towards things and actions as their irreducible surplus, not made of the same stuff they are. And the other important dimension of dirt related to enjoyment in jokes and comedy comes from the fact that it seems ugly to enjoy, for instance, at some other person's expense, his supposed deficiency, misfortune, exposure, ridicule, and so on. And of course, there are people uh, who object to jokes and joking in principle because this is the argument, the more hilarious the joke, the more hurtful and offensive it usually is for its path. So in the enjoyment experienced in mistreating or making fun of other people is a bad and ugly thing, so one should avoid it as a, as a matter of principle. This is not to say that if we want to be, let's say, politically correct in this respect, no jokes are allowed. They are, but only innocent jokes, the so-called abstract jokes, like jokes about geomet geometrical shapes. And I looked up some of these jokes, and I must say that they not so much resolve the problem as they perpetuate it, I think, on their own ground. And here are two examples. One, what did the triangle say to the circle? Your life seems so pointless. <laughs> and uh, the other one, uh, what did the hypotenuse say to the other side? Nice legs. So I think here you have it in a nutshell, aggressiveness, sexism. So the two tendencies that Freud recognized uh, at, the at the heart of all tendentions that is precisely non-innocent jokes. It's true the remarks do not refer in these cases to any particular person or group, I don't know, nationality, race, or gender, but the enjoyment in aggressive or sexual remark is clearly there making the jokes less innocent than one might want them to be. But of course, this problem with clearly delimiting innocent jokes is the problem of enjoyment as such. Enjoyment is somehow always enjoyment at someone's expense or of, as offensive to someone, even when it doesn't seem so at the first sight. Like, I don't know, in the classical example of someone driven crazy by the smell of the neighbor's cooking possibly a meal belonging to another ethnical tradition. So they cook, eat, and enjoy in the privacy of their kitchen, but since their enjoyment has a smell, they enjoy on their neighbor's expense, so to speak. Or to take the example of uh, passive smoking, the more you want to confine smokers and their enjoyment to their own clearly delimited space, the more the smoke of their enjoyment has the tendency to find a way out and annoy us. So one could say in one formula, to enjoy is to trespass, which is why all kinds of regulations proliferate in relation to this region. So social enjoyment registers as trespassing. So we can either all join in and expel the ones who don't want to partake in our way of enjoying, or else we unite in expelling the enjoyers. Communities, particularly I would say in the sense of Gemeinschaft, form themselves by way of excluding some forms of enjoyment as well as by more or less explicitly enjoying the partaking in others. And perhaps, very quickly put, the, the move from Gemeinschaft to Gesellschaft is to some extent at least the move away from enjoyment as this founding principle of the common, which we could say, of course, is a good thing. Its flip side, however, is that so far it hasn't found a much better way to tackle with the enjoyment that remains and keeps haunting the, the society, the social. It hasn't found a better way than to try to regulate it with more and more suffocating amount of rules and sub-rules and sub-sub-rules, ever new and more detailed and often debilitating regulations. And I think it is interesting that this is part, this is kind of these paradoxes, I think, now constitute an important source of inspiration in the increasing number of these TV legal series, you know, where the point is precisely where do exactly my rights end and somebody else's begin in the realm of 
enjoyment. So this just to say that this structural problem of enjoyment is real, we cannot simply sweep it under the carpet or under the banners of tolerance. Enjoyment, the moment it manifests itself as such, is always out of place because it has no place. It only exists at this intersection of the subject and the other. It doesn't have a room of its own, to paraphrase the famous title. That enjoyment has no room of its own also means that it has no form of its own, but sticks on to other forms, actions, words, and drives them, and eventually induces their repression. Uh, so I now move to the next part, which relates to this, which is called the birth of joke from the spirit of smut. And this concerns, of course, the, the classical Freudian account or reconstruction of the genealogy of joking. So for Freud, you probably know, a structurally obscene joke develops out of something uh, like that he calls smut, zote. Um, and the original scene of smart being that of a man trying to seduce a woman by obscene talk, speaking about sexual facts and relations, including the excremental in the most comprehensive sense. But this is not yet a joke. Only when, according to Freud, we rise to a society of a more refined education, do the formal conditions for jokes play a part. The smart becomes a joke and is only tolerated when it has the character of a joke in this higher society. And the technical method which it usually employs is the illusion. But I would like to return to SMART and insist a little bit more on it uh, because I think it's really worth reading Freud's account of it and its genesis, that is the genesis of SMART itself. So SMART, according to Freud, is originally directed to a particular person, a concrete person by whom one is sexually excited, and who, on hearing it, is expected to become aware of the speaker's excitement, and, as a result, to become sexually excited in turn. So Freud puts it, instead of the, this excitement, the other person may be led to feel shame or embarrassment, which is only a reaction against the excitement and, in a roundabout way, is an admission of it. Smart is thus originally directed towards women and may be equated with attempts at seduction." End of quote. So this is a kind of urstene, a man speaking dirty to a woman in an, an attempt to have sex with her. But of course, as everybody knows, women tend to resist this kind of approach. They might blush and thus reveal or conform their own excitement, but this is most often the, all the men will get out of this. Moreover, as Freud is careful to point out in what turns out to be a first turn of the screw, I quote again, if the woman's readiness emerges quickly, the obscene speech has short life. It yields at once to a sexual seduction. And hence, continues Freud, the woman's inflexibility is therefore the first condition for the development of smut, although to be sure, it seems merely to imply a postponement and does not indicate that further efforts will be in vain. Okay, what do we have here? Uh, I think you could see how almost unperceiving, unperceivingly smart has changed its place. From dirty talk aiming at and leading to the true goal, which would be sexual intercourse, it has become something of a goal in itself. If smart is to be smart, if it is to be fully developed and enjoyed, it needs an obstacle. Women at whom it is directed shouldn't be too ready, otherwise they spoil the fun, so to say. So they have to resist, yet the problem is, and this is this second shift, that one cannot even count on women to keep the resistance up. So, in other words, women are not only well known for resisting uh, overt sexual seduction and blushing instead, they are also notorious for their inconsistency in this. One never knows if and when they will change their mind and suddenly say yes. And this now becomes a more serious problem. With women's, and here I really don't want to mock fright or something, I think it's really true for any empirical target of, of smut, 
uh, every, any empirical target is inconsistent in this sense. And with this inconsistency, the smart who is now the subject of this game can never be sure to have enough space to fully perform its act. Which is why, and this is Freud again, uh, the ideal case of resistance of this kind on the woman's part occurs if another man is present at the same time. A third person, for in that case, an immediate surrender by the woman is as good as out of the question. So this is the famous introduction of this third person in Freud's discussion of the jokes and the relationship to the unconscious. You know, this third person, which is, I think, really a crucial uh, thesis that Freud introduces and is prized by Lacan a lot, namely that the joke it's never really a joke, only becomes a joke. It's not enough that it is written somewhere on a paper or that it exists, all the words can exist, but it only becomes a joke when it is sanctified by the person to whom we tell it. So this is precisely the third person, the other. So there is a joke, there is the butt of the joke, but there is this third person, this other person that actually when, if this person laughs, then the joke is, the jo joke is a joke. Otherwise, it is not. It fails, it is not a joke. It's not fully ontologically constituted in this sense. So uh, it, here it is precisely at this point in the uh, account that he gives of the development of SMAT that Freud introduces this notion of the third person, uh, and which is why I think it's very instructive to see in what office exactly it appears here. So it appears in the office of providing a solid obstacle to an immediate satisfaction of sexual need, as well as in the office of providing a wall alongside which smart can fully resonate and develop. And this is to say that a whole new kind, of course, of enjoyment begins here, or more precisely even that enjoyment proper only begins here. So the logic is not simply that of replacement, as one could be perhaps tempted to understand Freud's argument. It's replacement in the sense it is impossible to get it, so try to satisfy yourself with what is here. Enjoy the smart. Rather, it is a whole new it that starts here. It is not that now we have only access to bits and fragments of the lost thing, these bits and fragments that sustain this new enjoyment are not bits and fragments of the lost thing. They come, so to say, from elsewhere, from a different logic. And this way of putting it implies, of course, that even the most direct vul vulgar smut is already a circumvention. It also reveals the fact that circumvention itself can be a direct means of genuinely new species of pleasure called enjoyment. Which is why it can very well happen that people find more enjoyment in smut than in simple straight intercourse. So the obstacle here is not something that we need to circumvent in order to rejoin the realm of full enjoyment, so to say. The obstacle is also and already the condition of enjoyment on its own terms not the condition of enjoying something else, but precisely of enjoying that what it obstructs. But of course, in a different manner than in the logic of desire, when you have this external obstacle that enhances uh, your desire for the forbidden object, here the obstacle is intrinsic to satisfaction, enhancing it from the inside, so to say, giving it its place. So Freud is, of course, absolutely right in saying that when we laugh at a refined, obscene joke, we are laughing at the same thing that makes a peasant laugh at a coarse piece of smut. In both cases, the pleasure springs from the same source. Civilized people could never bring ourselves to laugh at the coarse smut because we feel ashamed. And it would seem simply disgusting to us, nothing to laugh at. So we can only laugh when a joke has come to help and transform this into something else. I think perhaps a possible problem with this account is uh, uh, the way it seems to situate the decisive cut of repression in the passage from vulgar smart to refined joke. I think this is precisely the reading we must avoid. Um, namely the reading according to which there is first some original 
enjoyment at work in smart, made impossible by restriction of culture, but nevertheless obtained or regained by means of jokes and comedy. I think the whole point of Freud's analysis of smart, as I quickly presented this, is not only that it is itself already fully cultural, you need this obstacle for smart to function, but also that its enjoyment is wholly gained and not lost because of culture. So I think you can see precisely at this point here how culture is exactly both, at the same time, source of inhibition and means of enjoyment proper. And the Freudian concept of repression refers precisely to the entanglement of these two things. That they are impossible to disentangle. And I think in the field of culture or art, comedy is precisely the, the genre that reminds us of this, of this uh, connection. Although comedy is often mistakenly perceived simply as a way of humiliating different kinds of highnesses and uh, sophistications, uh, I don't think this is really what is at stake in a serious comedy. The gesture of comedy is always twofold. It's always, uh, it says not only that the truth of high culture is vulgarity, but also that the truth of vulgarity is high culture or its implication. And I think there is more resistance to this second thesis than to the first one, which everybody is willing to uh, accept immediately. So, if it is true that the source of enjoyment is the same in the case of refined joke and coarse smart, it is so far as they both follow upon this cut of repression. So far as they are both already situated on the ground of culture, yet also keep falling out of it. I'm not saying by this that there is no difference between smart and jokes. Of course there is, but not this. It is not this situated on this level. So it is not only that behind its sophisticated form, a refined joke invites hidden enjoyment of vulgarity, of smart. It is also that vulgarity itself invites hidden, involves hidden enjoyment of vulgarity precisely. So a certain cut or a certain non-coincidence with itself also takes place here. We could say smart is a way of enjoying smart precisely. It's not immediate in this sense. And this is what comedy keeps telling us with its supposed, I think, directness. You know, this move that is very frequent in comedy is going on or showing the thing itself directly for the thing. Uh, it seems indeed that uh, somehow a little bit differently from joking, comedy never really loses its penchant for directness, for revealing things themselves. Yet this comic revealing is, if you stop to think of, of it a little bit, uh, as a matter of fact, it's never really revealing of some really totally unexpected hidden thing or truth. The comic surprise is a peculiar surprise at the expected somehow. We, we are surprised at something that is actually expected, but nevertheless, there is this comic surprise. You, you know, I don't know, we all keep repeating this joke, but I will repeat it again because it's the shortest example that I can think of. You know, this uh, line from Marx Brothers, look at this guy, he looks like an idiot, he behaves like an idiot, but don't be uh, misled, he is an idiot. So this way of coming back to the, say, to the point of departure, but with this surprise in the expected. So I think it is here in this seeming tautology precisely that we can also situate the famous, infamous phallic obedience of comedy starting with its alleged origins, you know, that according to Aristotle, comedy originates from so-called phallic songs, which were rituals honoring the Dionysus, uh, rituals in which the participants would march in procession, carrying a phallus of huge proportions made of animal skins, and singing obscene songs full of ambiguous innuendo. And this theory of the origins of comedy is uh, actually widely accepted and strongly corroborated by conventions of the staging on comedies in early days. Namely, the actors often wore costumes to which big leather phalluses were attached, sometimes additionally highlighted by being painted, for example, in red. 
But just think again of the, the peace it's seen. So you have people marching in procession, carrying a phallus of huge proportions, and singing obscene songs full of ambiguous innuendo. And now ask yourself this question, what is ambiguous innuendo doing in this setting if at the same time we have there no less than the fellows itself, in person, and fully blown, blown out of all proportions, so to say. And if one cares to think about it, it is indeed a bit strange. Usually we have either the thing itself or the allusion to it, innuendo suggesting it. But here it seems that they have both, we have both at the same time and at the same level. So what does the fact that they, the two appear on the same level tell us? The first conclusion that imposes itself is, follows is itself just another allusion, innuendo. But I think we must be more precise and say, phallus is not just another illusion. It is the illusion par excellence, mother of all illusions, so to say. It is the innuendo par excellence. It is the concrete universal of the very notion of illusion. The thing that refers, alludes to nothing but itself. If illusion consists of things alluding to other things, referring to other things, and phallus alludes only to itself. And I think this is precisely to, to point this out, it's the genuine comic move, the move from Pelus, Phallus as it functioned in ancient Greek mysteries precisely, that is to say, and all through then history, as a secret reference of allusion, of all speech, so to say, to Phallus as whatever, embodiment, signifier of the very logic of illusion, that is, as the illusion par excellence. But the gesture is not simply that of showing it instead of keeping it veiled, hidden for the mysteries. The point is precisely to, uh, to develop on stage its very logic, to show it as a way of referring, referring to itself. So in the same way, and following the same logic, the comic gesture of saying something directly or of saying that something is finally only what it is, is not a return to immediacy, but rather precisely the display of this non-coincidence of things with themselves. So we could say it all starts, all enjoyment starts not with immediacy, but with I, what I would call perhaps circumventing directness. And this is, I think, why it is wrong to conceive our cultural capacity to enjoy or not in a particular piece of comedy in terms of differences between more or less immediate. And to say, for example, that if one wanted to make us, for instance, us here, a bunch of supposedly well-cultivated people, if one wanted to make us laugh, one would need to do better than just stand there and pronounce dirty words such as ours, prick, and so on. Vulgar people might enjoy this kind of humor, but not us. Yet I think we couldn't be more wrong. And to prove, hopefully, this point, I now invite you to take a look to the following Rowan Atkinson stand-up act, which uh, splendidly resumes uh, many points that I made so far. So please. All right, come on, settle down, please. <laughs> Answer your names. Anus. <laughs> Ass bandit. <laughs> right, I'm going to the staff room now. But if I come back and catch herpes in the corridor like the headmaster did yesterday, <laughs> well, then there'll be trouble. <laughs> I think it's obvious what, what, what happens here. Atkinson uses absolute minimal means for quite uh, impressive results. He does li little more than just spell out dirty words and uses them in the most cliché sentences like clitoris, where are you, and so on. But of course, it's all about the way he does it. But what exactly is that way? Could we not say that by saying it all out loud explicitly, he produces in this uh, stand-up act precisely the effect of illusion, of innuendo. He takes the dirty words, make them sound proper by presenting them as names, and then in a third step, 
allows us to recognize the allusion to dirt in them. So he kind of creates the thing he circumvents in the very act of circumvention. And in view of this, we could perhaps propose the following hierarchy of comedy in this respect at least. We could say that in a bad comedy, you just say ours. In a better comedy, you find the ingenious, interesting way of alluding to it. In the best comedy, you say ours as a way of alluding to it, as you find a way to expose this precisely. And I think that the empty space you circumscribe in that way, uh, it hence produce as something, as a certain space with some density, is precisely the enjoyment room of its own, so to say. Or perhaps not so much its room of its own as its scene. We could say that comedy is the scene of enjoyment in this sense. Uh, instead of allocating the enjoyment a private room of one's own, it constructs, creates, opens up a scene for it in the theatrical meaning of the word. And I think this has some implications which go beyond just comedy. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>